horribly wrong. As Vitalina prepared to give birth to her second child in Sao Tome and Principe, a tiny island nation off the coast of West Africa. She began to bleed heavily, and the doctors mistakenly gave her the wrong type of blood during a blood transfusion. The baby was born safely, but Vitalina suffered a severe infection in her legs. To save her life, the doctors amputated both legs. Vitalina was just 19 years old. After this tragedy, Vitalina's husband left her for another woman. Depression overwhelmed her, and she considered suicide. I felt a lot of pain, and I asked God, let me die, please kill me, God, because I cannot live with this pain. But God had a purpose, a plan for me, so he allowed me to live. Vitalina worked hard not to burden her family. She sewed to pay the bills and the people who assisted her with house chores she couldn't do. After some time, a Seventh-day Adventist woman who washed Vitalina's clothes got sick. I wanted to find another person, but the woman said, don't worry, I'm going to ask church members to come wash your clothes. At that time, I wasn't an Adventist, so I told her not to do it. But she didn't listen. She asked people at church, and they came and washed some of my clothes. When a group of Adventist girls arrived at Vitalina's home to help with washing clothes, she only gave them some of her clothes and told them that was all. But eager to help, the girls decided to look through the house for more items to clean. Then they took her clothes to the river and sang as they washed. They washed and washed, and then they invited me to an evangelistic meeting. I attended it and decided to accept Jesus. After her baptism, Vitalina was eager to share her new faith. She told her personal testimony to everyone who would listen. Look at me, she told people who stopped by her home. God is working in me, and I'm able to work. God is wonderful, and you need to trust him. Through her witnessing, Vitalina convinced seven people to go with her to the closest Adventist church. She even paid their bus fare for weeks. All seven people are now baptized members of the Adventist church. Vitalina also organized a Bible study group outside her home, and six more people were baptized. Soon she led 40 people to baptism, including two of her children. Church leaders began drafting plans to open a church in her neighborhood. Lacking funds to buy land, the church accepted an offer from Vitalina to build a temporary structure outside her house. I used to go to the closest Adventist church, but it was still far. Now I feel happy about this. I feel content because it's much closer now. It was expensive to visit there, and I needed people to take me there because I couldn't go alone. This humble church is made of people who are on fire for mission. After the Sabbath service each week, they go out the door singing and shaking each other's hands. As Vitalina shakes each hand, she is reminded that God will one day give us victory over everything that leaves us helpless. I pray for this community that we may win them for Christ. There are still a lot of people here who need Christ. This is my mission. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, Jesus, soldiers of the cross. Behind his royal banner, we must not suffer loss. Victory unto victory, his heart which not he leave. Till every foe 
our gracious Heavenly Father. Indeed, how, what a privilege it is for us as your people to gather together and to worship you. Father, we come, as Jesus said, we come to worship you in spirit. And Father, we pray that you will bless us this day, and may we all know that we have been in your presence. In Jesus' wonderful and beautiful name, amen. Well, I think we have a few announcements we have to make here this morning. First of all, I want to welcome everyone here today. It's good to see every one of you this morning. And God is good, isn't he? Amen. What a beautiful Sabbath day we have today. Well, there's one, uh, one good thing we have here today. I know that. And we have a transfer of membership. And uh, we have a transfer of the second reading of Simone, Aaliyah, and Seth Tomlinson. Are they here? Anyway, let's, let's vote them in. Do we have a motion that we vote them in? And we have a second. A lot of seconds. All in favor, say, raise your hand. I'll say, say aye, but raise your hand. Very good. It's carried then. And we're happy that they're members here. They were here every meeting uh, this week, at Pathfinders. Uh, and I tell you what, that was a tremendous uh, week of prayer the Pathfinders put on. And you can be proud of our young people, the Pathfinders. It's just tremendous. And you know, they're trying to get money to go to Oshkosh. And yes, they're willing to work and do whatever they can uh, to make the money. But they'll probably need some contributions uh, so they can get to Oshkosh. This is a once in a lifetime. I'm telling you, it is really something to see thousands and thousands and thousands of Pathfinders, not only from this country, from all over the world. It is really a tremendous uh, event and something that our kids will always remember. And it really does. I mean, they have a tremendous spiritual program there. Not only will they be learning all kinds of crafts and they'll be uh, meeting uh, kids from all over the world, and, uh, but they have a tremendous spiritual program for them. It, it is marvelous and um, even some baptism. So it, it is really great and I, I hope that we can and get our pathfinders there. I, I know God is blessing, and we're going to get them there. And I think, Wayne, you have something that you wanted to say this morning here. Last Sabbath turned out phenomenal. It couldn't have happened if it hadn't been for you. And I will tell you right now, there are many people that work for days and weeks and so on like that just to make it happen. And I'll tell you right now, a lot of things that we had laid out months before, we got called at the last minute and told that the conference president wouldn't be here and a few other things that happened. And I'll tell you what, we just kind of rolled with it and made it happen. But it couldn't have happened if it hadn't been for the dedication of each of you. I know, I, I had been asking every day for a period of three weeks for the conference to send me a biographical sketch and four JPEGs, meaning pictures. Didn't happen. And then after the secretary left, they arrived 30 minutes later. I tell you right now, vote, it drove me nuts. Uh, I told them down there at the conference office, I said, I'll tell you what, if I tried to get into the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, in Salt Lake City, I could have made it twice as fast as I have. In fact, I could have made it in a matter of minutes, and I couldn't get into the conference office. But it all came together, and it came together <laughs> because each one of you, I mean, I think of putting together that lunch so that we could have served 200 people and, and so on like that. It is just phenomenal what each of you did and the stories that you told, the things that happened. Folk, thank you so very much. I want to mention a couple of other things. Lincoln, and you know I can't tell you when people are sick or in the hospital. That's against HIPAA. And everybody's using HIPAA today, even if you're not a hospital. But Lincoln called me and he said, Wayne, he says, you can tell the people, yes, I was in the hospital for three or four days and that I had a procedure done 
And the wonderful thing is, they didn't find anything wrong. The terrible thing is, they didn't find anything wrong. So he's still dealing with the issues and so on like that, but he appreciates each of your prayers and so on like that. I uh, want to mention another thing. Uh, new person, you haven't met him, Hugh Mighty. Hugh, stand up, will you? Hugh is a new chaplain at the hospital, and he's here today. And you know, this is where all the chaplains go to church. <laughs> We've just got to get him a little bit closer because he, he worships down there in, in uh, Orlando. And uh, I'll tell you what, what a mighty chaplain he is. Mighty in every way. So I hope you'll get acquainted with you. And uh, Hugh, there are several other chaplains within the audience here. So expect them to reach out shake your hand today. Um, the next thing I have to share with you is of great concern. I know a lot of you have worked at LRMC for a long time. Last night, there was a very serious accident, horrific accident. And uh, Joan Taylor, who has been the cashier at the cafeteria uh, for years died last night in that accident and uh, Chaplain Mary called me she told me yesterday she says Wayne I won't be in town I know that you're going to be here and I'm not worried well she's still in town and uh, we're dealing with grief in the hospital down there among the staff the nurses and so on her friend that was with her June Gleason actually survived the accident and is at home. So if you are a worker from LRMC, and I know several, two of you at least, are here in the congregation that have worked in the cafeteria at LRMC, I know you would have wanted to know that. Thank you. I have a need this morning. Didn't realize I had a need until I went out into the back hall. I need somebody to help teach children Sabbath school. Very rewarding job. Just one person is all I need. Somebody please stop me before we leave today and say you'll do it. What a joy to do it. Thank you very much. One of the children. Did you want to do it? No. <laughs> then you don't find out. <laughs> she wants to do it, I'll tell her. Okay? Good job. Thank you. It's time now for our children's offering. If they'll come forward, following the offering, we're going to have the story told to us by Ann Lawrence. And I'm looking forward to it.
Yes. Well, I have a story to tell you today about something that I wondered about from the time I was a little girl. I was always told by my grandmother, be sure your sins will find you out. Whenever I did anything wrong, she would tell me that. Well, how are you going to know? I would hide. I mean, I would, I would look around before I did whatever she told me not to do. Look up. I always heard you had to look up. But how would my sins find me out? Any idea? I, I, I looked stuff in the Bible, and in Numbers 32, 23, it said, be sure your sins will find you out. What does that mean? It means no matter what you do, God sees it, and it will bite you back. Yes, that's, that's good. It means that no matter what you do, God sees that. Anybody else? No, well, I looked it up in the dictionary, and it said, be sure your sins will be found out. It will be found out. That's what it means by it will find you out. So my story today is about two kids, a boy and a girl, and they both were found out. Well, my first story goes back to the island of Barbados. And there was a lady that had four children. Oh, and she always looked over them and she would tell them not to do this and not to do that. But these four children somehow found a way of doing what they wanted to do. But right across the street from their house was a big fruit tree. It's called Dunks. And whenever mama wasn't looking, those kids would sneak out. Well, one day mama was going to town and she said to her children, do not go outside while I'm gone. The older brother was supposed to look after the children. And as soon as mama was out of sight, guess what happened? What? They dashed out the door and across the street to get some of those yummy fruits off the tree. Well, there was a big sister that was there, and she said, when she wasn't getting any dunks and the guys were up in the tree picking, I, <laughs> the, the young girl said, Mama's coming. When they heard Mama's coming, one of the boys jumped out of the tree, and he jumped on a can that was open, and it was a very sharp edge. And it sliced his foot open, and you could see the white bone. Ask me how you could see the bone. I think I know that girl that said mama was coming. And I know the guy that jumped out of the tree. And he's here today. Maybe he would tell you that he's got a scar this long. Did his sin find him out? Sometimes it takes many years, but sometimes it happens right away. Well, when Mama came home, this gash was bleeding, and they had to take him to the hospital. Not the hospital. I think they took him to a doctor's office, and they had to sew that wound up, and they didn't give him anything to numb the pain. They just said, hold on tight to this guy while they put the sutures in. Did, yeah, I know, that was gross. But he has learned a valuable lesson, right? Now, the second story is about a little girl. They called her Betsy. And I read this from Uncle Arthur's storybook, so it's a true story. Betsy saw a house building in her neighborhood, and she pretended it was her house. And she would stand and she would watch them dig the basement and then the walls went up. And she kept saying, oh, my house is coming along so well. I wish I could go in and see where they are today. But Betsy's mom said, no, do not go into that house. You may fall into the basement. You may trip over something and hurt yourself. But Bessie thought, all the other kids in the neighborhood is going into that house. Why can't I? And it's my house after all. I should be able to see what's going on. So one day, mommy, 
was going to town. Again, another mummy going to town. And when Betsy looked around, and she looked around this way and that way, Mama was gone. And she dashed into the house. But when she got there, to her surprise, all the neighborhood kids were there, and they were having fun, climbing up the ladders. There were no workers around. So Betsy decided she was going up a ladder too. If the boys could do it, why can't I? So she climbed up the ladder and she started to go across, inching her way across the joists or the rafters, those wood that go across. And all of a sudden she felt a pain in her leg. And when she looked, there was about three inch splinter sticking out of her leg. Ooh, it hurt. She tried to pull it, but she wasn't brave enough to pull it out, so she would stop, and she, eventually she sat down in one spot, and she said, oh, I wish I had listened to Mama. I have to tell her what I've done. She's going to know that I have disobeyed. I can't let her know. So she pulled and pulled, and eventually it broke off. And all she could see is a little dot in the side of her leg. Oh, it was hurting so bad. How can I tell mama about it? I know mama would be able to take that out. So she decided, you know what? I'm not going to tell her at all. I'm going to man up. I'm going to be tough. And the pain will go away. Well, day by day, it gradually, she got used to it not hurting so bad. Well, a week went by, it was still there. Two weeks, a year went by. Betsy said two years went by, four years, 10 years. By this time, she was 15 years old. And then one day, oh, something was wrong with her leg. And Betsy remembered the splinter that was there. And it was all red and festering. She said, I might as well. I gotta, I'm sick. I got to tell mama it's getting red and it's getting worse. So she went to her mom and she confessed. She said, mama, this is what I did a long time ago. Now it's hurting. What can I do? I don't want to lose my leg. But you know what? Mama was so kind and helpful and gentle. She took that splinter out. And Bessie wished, why did I live with this splinter in my leg for so many years when Mama was so kind? You know, somebody else watches us and tells us what to do and what not to do. And he was just like Betsy's mom. He said in John 1, 1 John 1, verse 9, if you confess, do you know what confess mean? If you own up to, if you admit that you've done wrong or you've sinned, that means that you've disobeyed me. I am faithful. I'm loyal. I want to forgive you. If only you would come and tell me, I will clean you. I will forgive you. And I would behave like if it never happened before. And that's God. So God is telling us, be sure our sins will find us out. But if we admit our sins, he's faithful and just, and he will forgive us and give us a home in his kingdom. Isn't that a good deal? Yes. So none of us are perfect. We all make mistakes. Our sins, if we hold on to them, they will fester. But if we admit them to Jesus Christ, he will forgive us, and we will spend eternity with him. Okay, that's it. Now, anybody's got any Bible verses they want to say for me today? Okay. May the God of hope fill you with all joys, peace, as you trust in him, so that you may overflow, overflow with love by the power of the Holy Spirit. Whatever you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it for the glory of God, 1 Corinthians 10.31. Amen. Amen. Anything for you? Yeah. Okay. Okay, who's going to pray? All right. All right. Please bow your heads and close your eyes. Dear Lord, thank you for loving us and giving us life. Thank you for, for letting us know that we can tell you 
anything that we committed, and you will act like it never happened, because you, you're, you're the most lovely, loving person in the world. Um, thank you for sending your sinless son to die on the cross for us, for, for the, all the sinners on the earth. We love you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Okay, you may go back to your seat. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. We're going to sing this precious melody to worship our Lord Jesus. It's prayer time now. What a privilege it is. Do you ever think about that? You came this morning, and we have an opportunity to talk to God. Wow. I invite you to come up. If you'd like to bring your prayer requests, if you'd like to come up, Pray with us up here. Please come. As many as possible, let us kneel for prayer. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning to unload all of our burdens on you, to recognize you as our Savior, as our God, 
as our protector. We'd ask this morning that you come very close to us and help us to draw close to you. We've sinned. We continue to sin. And we need to understand your forgiveness and your correction and help to go the right way. We pray this morning for the people who have asked for an interest in our prayers. There are health needs. There are salvation needs. We pray for a pastor this morning that you may put the words in his mouth that may feed us for your name. Help us that we may want to choose you in this great conflict on earth. May we want to be saved. May we choose to find those things that will help and that you are trying to teach us. Forgive us for falling short. Grant us a home with you. For Jesus' sake, amen. As you've heard me say so many times, I feel this is the high spot of the church service, the time when we, can re, when we can return, really, a very small portion of what God has so abundantly given us. I believe that with all my heart. We've talked many times about God communicating and asking us one thing, to give us back give him back 10% of our increase. And in so doing, he has challenged us. He says, see if I want to open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing so abundantly you won't be able to hold it. Knowing that I was going to call for the offering today, I was looking in the Bible and thinking, and I came upon Proverbs 22.9. I'm going to read it to you. New International Version. A generous man with himself, if be blessed, for he shares his food with the poor. I want to read that again. A gracious man will himself be blessed. I stumbled on reading it the first time. And my mind took me back to something I had read in a devotional book many years ago. Isn't that funny? Something you'll read, how it'll hang up, hang with you. And the name come to me, his name was Donald Ernest Mansell. He wrote the devotional book in 1993, As Sure as the Dawn. Excuse me a moment. He has quite a history in himself. When he was young, his parents were missionaries in Japan during the war, and they were interned, I think, for three years in a prison camp over there. He's had quite a background. He's been a missionary himself, a pastor, and he's worked in the conference where he's been at. And he was telling a story, and I'll repeat the story as he told it. Many, many years ago, a young man was traveling out to Colorado. 
going through the Midwestern state, mid uh, central states, mid states in the center of the United States. And he came up on a farm. He was tired. It was getting late in the evening. And so he went up to the farmer's house, knocked on the door. The farmer came to the door and he said, is it possible I could stay with you overnight? And the farmer said, sure. So they were making arrangements and he showed him the room that he could have when another knock came on the door. The farmer went to the door and there was a young couple, married couple, and they had stopped also. They were traveling out west and they needed a room for the night. The young man of the woman's husband is, is who I'm talking about. Said, sir, he said, I've only got four dollars. The farmer said to him, he said, don't worry about it. You can stay with us. We'll put you up for the night. Well, the first young man, seeing that, noticed he had a terrible cough. He was hung over and looked very, very pale. They asked him what the problem was with his health, and he had tuberculosis, and it was quite strong. So the young man, the first young man, said, you stay in my room, and I'll go out and sleep in the barn. So they did. As they got ready to leave the next morning, the farmer went up to the married couple, to the young man, and took his hand out and placed a $100 bill in it and clamped it. He said, do not worry about paying me back. He said, I want to help you and I want to see that you get to your destination. They thanked him profusely and left. Well, time went by. In fact, 20 years went by. And the first young man was in the neighborhood passing by, and he said, I'm going to stop in and see if that farmer is still there. And so he did, knocked on the door, the farmer came. They remembered each other, and they started talking. And lo and behold, the door knocked again. The farmer went to the door, and here was this young man that had tuberculosis so many years ago with his wife, with a, literally broke, was at the door coming down. This is unheard of, you know. What's the chances of this same three people getting together again on the same day? Well, the young man told the farmer that he'd gotten well, and through effort, preservation, prayer, the Lord had blessed him abundantly. I mean, really abundantly. And he says, I'm here today because I heard about that you were in some financial stress, quite some stress. I understand that you must be struggling to take care of it. And the farmer just kind of passed it off. He said, I'm here to repay you for what you did for me. So if you hold out your hand, I'm going to put $100 for each dollar that you gave me. You do the math. Well, we don't always like to talk about money because God doesn't always give money back on his blessings. And we always talk about the 10% coming back that God asks us to give him. That's all he's ever asked him. But brothers and sisters, this is about the love offerings that we give. God still blesses abundantly. Proof. I'd like to close my thought with you, taken from Luke 6.38. Jesus said, Given, it will be given to you, a good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over, will be poured into your lap. Isn't that something? Just wanted to say that. Today our offering emphasis is uh, for Florida Advance. One of the many reaches in the Advance program is planning churches, working with them, establishing them, growing, helping the growth. What a wonderful, wonderful arm it is. So if the deacons will come forward, this time we'll have prayer. 
Our Heavenly Father, thank you so much for another lesson in your love, how much you love us, proving to us once again we can't outgive you. But we love you so much. So please, Father, as we turn in our offerings and love offerings this morning, not only bless it, but doubly and triply bless it that it might multiply, multiply, and go for its intended use with many, many results. We thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Our scripture this morning is taken from the book of Revelation, chapter 14, verses 6 and 7. Revelation 14, 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. May God bless the reading of his word.
could ever afford. He ransomed his life for my pardon. Since Christ paid in full, no. Uh, Ivan beautiful song wasn't it what a message what a message and I'm going to be talking about that near the end of my message today <clears throat> we live in a world that's in turmoil do you realize that I don't really have to talk too much about that you recognize it right it's in turmoil politically religiously and philosophically it is in turmoil. I believe in the God of the Bible. You see, Christians are being made fun of today. Do you realize that? They're being made fun of. People just need to go over and just you just worship by yourself, but we don't want to hear about it, right? Don't tell us about it. You just do your own thing. Don't bother us with this nonsense. But I tell you, it is not nonsense. 
because God has a message for this world today. This world is becoming more godless every day. More and more of our young people are coming out of our universities who don't believe in God, who believe in the theory of evolution. They believe that there is no absolute truth, no absolute truth at all, that truth is relative. Whatever the individual believes to be truth, well, that has to be true for them. But I believe in a God who indeed is the absolute truth. I believe that he came to this world. Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, came to this world and he revealed what God is really like so that there is no misunderstanding. And he demonstrated the power of creation when he was here. Do you believe that? I believe the miracles of Jesus. I don't believe some of these theologians who say, well, that's only myth that didn't happen. I believe that it really did happen because I believe in the eyewitness account that Jesus performed these miracles. I believe that he fed 4,000 people, 5,000, on just a little bit of food. And there was plenty left over. I believe that Jesus resurrected Lazarus, a man who had been dead for four days. Jesus brought him back to life. He called Lazarus, come forth, and he came forth. Jesus is indeed the creator of all things. The Bible is very clear by, of, of that, isn't it? In 1 John, it talks about that. Atheism is adding to its ranks people every day. Do you realize that? More and more people are becoming atheists who don't believe in the God of the Bible. In the very beginning, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, it says this, in the beginning God, created the heavens and the earth. That is an assumption, is it not? He is assuming, and I believe that Moses was the one who wrote the book of Genesis. He is assuming as, th this is actual fact, God created the heavens and the earth. He created it, an assumption. And yet the evolutionists say that's ridiculous. Everything came into existence through a process of evolution. And we have scientific evidence to prove it. When I was in high school, I was taught the theory of evolution and creation. It was taught as a theory. Now it's being taught as actual fact. This is the way it happened through a process of evolution, evolving. It took millions and millions and millions and year of years. And finally, here we are. Intelligent life. Wow, isn't that something? Miracle of miracles. When you think of, you know, when, the, when people say it's a miracle, what do you think of? It's a miracle. I think of a little newborn baby. <laughs> what do we say? That's a miracle, right? When my children were born, I said, that's a miracle. I can't believe it. That's a miracle, right? It's a miracle. Life is a miracle. Do you realize that the evolutionists, whether they want to say it or not, believe in miracles? Oh, yeah. Everything just happened just happened. Hmm. The assumption that God is, we all have evidence of that. It's all around us, is it not? We all have evidence that God is. 
How, what is the evidence that he gives us? It's in creation itself, isn't it not? When you look at everything in, this, in nature, it is a miracle, is it not? To me, it's a miracle. I think, oh, I stand in awe of this. And I believe that God created it. Because I think of all the different varieties of, the, the, of plant life, of the animal kingdom. And then I look at the very small insects, and I marvel at that. When I was in, in college, I took natural history, biology and natural history. That's when we had to go out and collect insects, you know, and we had to do all that stuff. I was amazed when I looked at those little insects through a microscope. It is amazing. It just makes my God bigger and bigger. And then we go into bacteria. There are scientists who that's all they do is study bacteria. And they keep learning and learning and learning new things. It's amazing. All the different bacteria. And then I know uh, Brother Bill has talked about all of the microbes in our digestive system, right? I mean, it's just it's mind-boggling. What, millions and billions of them? I don't know. It's just, that's mind-boggling to me. But we need those. It just didn't happen. You know, how can we have all the different kinds of trees and plant life and all of these things that they just all evolved? Boy, it really took a miracle, didn't it? It really took a miracle for those things to happen through evolution. They believe in miracles. Whether they like to say it or not, they believe in a miracle. That this all happened by chance. How ridiculous can we get? And if we don't believe in a personal and infinite God, we are left, we are left with absolutely nothing. We are to figure out what is right and wrong on our own, subjective reasoning. We can come to the place where what's right for you is wrong for me. What's right for me is wrong for you, etc. You, you get the story. You get the picture. That's what it is. It's so ridiculous when we begin to think about these things and to reason it out. And the one marvelous thing of it all is how did we get mind and intelligence from chance? It took a miracle. <laughs> I don't care what the evolutionists say. It took a, if you believe in evolution, it took a miracle to get a mind and intelligence. It is ridiculous. It is ridiculous. Listen, behind Behind every reality, behind every reality, there is intelligence. Hmm? Behind every reality is intelligence. All of the automobiles out here, if I looked at those for the first time and I did not believe in God, I could propose that they all evolved in time. Think of a little ant. There are two ants talking. Two little ants talking. And they're seeing all the cars. And they see them moving on the road. And they're talking. How did this happen? And the one says, well, I, I believe that they all evolved. Isn't that ridiculous? You see, behind every automobile, there is the reality of the automobile is an intelligence. Behind every reality, the reality of the world, the reality of nature itself, there is an intelligence. There has to be. Can't have it any other way. That's what I believe. I believe. The evolutionists say, you know, they start with matter. They start with energy. You know what? Matter is only, as we understand it, a, um, a solid form of energy. That's what matter is. 
energy being transposed or transformed into matter. That's mind-boggling to me. But I believe it to be so. Who was the instigator behind the reality of energy and matter? It was God himself. And when you look at this world, only this world, but when you look at the universe, it had to be a tremendous amount of energy, right? I'm telling you, our God is a big God, isn't he? He is really big. He is beyond our comprehension. We can't comprehend him. He is beyond us. We stand in awe of him, of his creative power. And how this great God of ours, he restrains his power. He doesn't coerce us. He doesn't force us. He doesn't force us or, or, or makes us believe in him. He doesn't make people believe in Jesus. He doesn't do that at all. Isn't he tremendous? Isn't he great? Oh, it's mind-boggling to me. The picture of God is so great and so marvelous. He is the intelligence behind creation. And Jesus, our creator, the one who created the universe, the active agent in creation, he is the one who came to this world and revealed himself to us. Did he use his power in an overwhelming way to make people believe in him? No. He just told it the way it was and left people to make their own decision. They make their own decision. For he spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood, what? Fast. Psalm 33, 9. Well, look at Romans. What happens when you separate from God and you say, I don't want anything to do with him? What happens then? People begin to make their own gods, right? And he speaks about this in Romans chapter 1. He speaks about this. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. In other words, they know the truth, but they hold it in unrighteousness because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. Verse 19, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse because that when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful. I believe this. I believe God reveals himself to every human being. And I'm going I'm to get to that. <laughs> How does he do that? There are three basic questions that every human being has to answer. And they are, where did I come from? What am I doing here? And where am I going after death? Every philosopher, every atheist, every pantheist, I don't care who they are, they have to answer those questions. And I've told you this story before. I'm not senile. I'm going to tell it again. <laughs> okay? <laughs> because my own experience. How do I know that what I'm saying is true? It is from my own experience as a human being. It is through my observation of nature. And it is through the scriptures. It's my relationship with people. When I was four years old, I was outside playing. Remember the story? I was outside playing. Beautiful day, just like today. I'll never forget it. It is, it, is, it is impressed in my mind in such an indelible way that a question came into my mind out of the blue. And it was this. Where did all of these things come from? And I looked around the trees, the birds, the dirt I was playing in, 
all of the green grass, all of the animals, the farm animals. Where did all of this come from? Four years old. I tell you this. I did not, on my own, that did not just come of my own will. God spoke to me when I was four years old. That question. I ran into the house and I asked my mother, Mama, where did all of these things come from? And she said, God created them. I'm glad she wasn't an evolutionist or an atheist. She was at, well, after millions and billions and trillions of years, all of this stuff happened just by chance. By accident, it just happened. Dear people, it is not an accident. It wasn't by chance. There is an intelligence behind this reality that we are in. And the reality that we are soon to be in, when Jesus comes and takes us to heaven, that will be another reality. He is behind all of it. It will be real. As real as this reality is today. We will be there. If we believe in Christ Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we will be there. It is very sad that people today believe in the theory of evolution. I want to read you something. And this is, this is the theory of evolution. The currently popular theory of chemical evolution assumes that the initial process that eventually led to the appearance of primitive life forms began in the atmosphere of the planet. The necessary ingredients of such life-producing atmosphere were water vapor, carbon, and nitrogen-containing gases. Under the influence of ultraviolet radiation or perhaps other energy sources, the components of that atmosphere, of this atmosphere, then combined to form biological significant compounds, amino acids, simple uh, sugars and fats produced in the, this manner in the, the atmosphere, collect on the surface of the planet. Given sufficiently long periods of time, these simple substances assemble themselves into proteins, complex sugars, um, nacelic acid, membranes, and eventually into living entities. <laughs> what do you believe? That's a miracle. They believe in miracles. They believe time plus manner, matter, time plus matter plus chance equals life. Chance. Chance. How ridiculous all of this becomes, isn't it? It is ridiculous. I'm sorry, but they are foolish. The evolutionists are foolish. And what kind of a world do we have because of the theory of evolution and atheistic beliefs? You can look at history and what it leads to. You see, if I am just evolved, then what purpose do I have? Where am I going? I'm going to get all I can out of this world that I can get. Hitler believed it. Look what happened. Stalin believed it. Look what happened. I mean, you can look at all of these things these people believe. Human life is, 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 is not important. It isn't sacred anymore. But to the Christian, life is sacred, is it not? That's why we were to look at every individual, every individual as sacred, no matter who they are, where they're at. They're sacred. Their life is sacred. It comes from God. Before matter, there was energy. Before energy, there is God. 
You see, the evolutionist doesn't, well, where did the world come from? Where did all this other stuff come from? Well, we have the Big Bang Theory, you know, and all of this stuff. How did that happen? A miracle of miracles. Out of nothing, all of a sudden, things appear. I believe in the God of the Bible as the creator. He is the creator. And you see, we, we have people who believe these things and who, who, who the philosophers who say, well, you know, everything, truth, there's no absolute truth. There's no absolute truth at all. It's all relevant. You know, Jesus, or Pilate asked Jesus a question, right? What is truth? He didn't stay long enough to get an answer. He wished he had it, but he didn't. He left. What is truth? In other words, in his own mind, he'd already made it up. Truth is relative. But there is such a thing as absolute, absolute truth. There is such a thing. And people who say there is no such thing as absolute truth and they believe it to be true, if there's no absolute truth, it proves, their very theory proves that they're wrong. Right? I mean, it's like a dog chasing his tail. I remember in, in college I studied, had a class of philosophy and studied the different philosophers. And I was trying to figure out what in the world is a person saying because it's kind of like an abstract language. I couldn't understand what they were saying. And then when I finally figured out, I said, why can't you just put it in simple language so everybody can understand it? But they want to appear as, you know, intelligent, of being so smart, of being so above everybody else. They're foolish because philosophy is man-centered. Theology is God-centered. People are becoming more and more man-centered. You see, the atheist... What is morality to an atheist? What is it? Where, how do they determine what is moral and what isn't? There are a lot of good moral atheists, don't get me wrong. And there's some bad ones. Well, they look at man. Man is where they get it. Man is it. They look at man. Well, if I look at human beings, what conclusion can I get? I see a lot of evil. I see some good, so I see a mixture. So if I'm going to develop that belief system in regard to what is right and what is wrong, and if I'm just looking at human beings, what conclusions am I going to come out with? They're going to be all warped and twisted, I can tell you that. You see, human beings, people today, are looking at man for a point of reference for morality. And look what kind of a world we got. Do you know that more and more people are being, they are, they are losing all confidence in the religious and political, well, especially political leaders, right? All over the world because of corruption. Because of corruption. They have no confidence anymore. What's happened to people? Their point of reference in regard to morality is mankind himself. Me, I will determine what is right and wrong. I will determine what is truth and what is not truth. That's all man-centered. And every time it is a disaster. And we're looking at a disaster taking place in this country because of that very thing that's taking place. Listen, Jesus, Jesus himself believed the story of creation. Well, why wouldn't he? He was a creator, wasn't he? I want you to look at Matthew chapter 19 and verse 4. And he answered and said unto them, have you, have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? Both male and female, he made them both. Atheism is ridiculous. What? You see, we should have a burden for this. At all times, Seventh-day Adventist Christians should be standing up for our God. Shouldn't we? Yes. You know, like, we, we should be out in front. We should pro be proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ. We should be telling the truth about him, about our God, and not be ashamed of it. I want you to look at Revelation chapter 14 in our scripture reading real quickly with me. Revelation 14. 
and verses 6 and 7, our scripture reading this morning. I want you to take note. I'm going to point a few things out here. You see, this goes right in what I'm talking about. I've been talking about this whole series of the great controversy, the, the, the cosmic conflict between good and evil, between Christ and Satan. And here we have it, saying with a loud voice, these angels, all right. Let's look at verse 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them to dwell in the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. That means the entire world. Saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. This is a, a reference to Exodus chapter 20, to the Sabbath commandment, the fourth commandment. Is it not? That's what it is. To worship. God is calling, you see, God is a God of judgment. There isn't any question about that. And he is telling people, I want you to be ready or judgment is coming. You see, this message is a message of hope, of salvation. It is just like in the flood. And, you know, the fountains of waters that he mentions here, he's talking all the way back to Genesis, what, 6 and 7, about the flood, the story of the flood. The fountains of the, of the deep broke loose, right? And water came forth. Jesus believed in the flood. The Bible writers believed in the universal flood. You see, today it's being taught that it was just a local flood. No, I believe in a worldwide flood. I believe what the Bible says. I believe in a six-day creation week. I believe that. 24 hours every day, I believe that. You see, we have the theistic evolutionists who believe that everything just began. God just started the, the process of evolution. He went away and let things happen. You just have to shake your head at all of this. They deny the power of God. If God is such a God, how in the world can this powerless God in my mind, how in the world can he change the hearts and minds of people? How can he speak to us? How can he redeem us? To me, that kind of a God is a powerless God. He has no power. But saying with a loud voice, fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him that made heaven and earth. You understand this? He's calling all of the evolutionists to... He's calling all of the atheists. Listen, you're going to miss out. I love you so much. I want to save you. Jesus is the answer, is he not? And yet people refuse to believe. They find all kinds of excuses. It is very, very sad. I believe that we need the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And this is the way this message is going to go forth. Don't you believe that? That's what we need. We need the outpouring of the Holy Spirit in our lives. John chapter 12. Look at John chapter 12. Real quickly here. John in the 12th chapter. And beginning with verse 44, I, and Jesus cried and said, He that believeth on me, believeth not on me, but on him that sent me. And he that seeth me seeth him that sent me. I am come, a, I am come a light unto the world, into the world, that whosoever believeth on me should be not not abide in darkness. And if any man hear my words and believe not, I judge him not. Now isn't that something? Jesus is saying. He says here, for I came not to judge the world but to save it. But here in Revelation, it is a message also of judgment, is it? Judgment is coming. Not now, not at the present, but it's coming. Just as Noah preached for 120 years, and I believe that he had other people in the beginning, especially to help him build that ark, who passed away before the flood, and they were also proclaiming this message of hope, of salvation, were they not? But judgment was also in the message because 
you know, God is going to destroy this world by a flood. There is time for you to believe and to come into the ark. But we know how that story ended. Only eight people were saved. But there is still hope here. God has, God has, he says, I didn't come, Jesus. I didn't come to condemn the world. But in Revelation, he says, it's time for you to get serious about this and to get, put away your foolishness and worship me as the creator. And not only as a creator, but as your, your redeemer. He that, he that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. For I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment that I should say, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so, uh, so I speak. How can people turn down such a great salvation as this? I don't know. But they're doing it. More and more people are doing it all the time. That's why the message of revelation is so revelant, re, or, or has, has revelance today. Is because we're in, we're in it. We're in it right now. We're in that time right now. I believe that. I am convinced of it. Evil is growing more and more in the hearts and minds of people every day. And we see it every day. And you know, we're becoming callous to it because we hear it so often. A man kills his wife and his children. A mother does the same thing. Some man goes in and kills a lot of people, shoots them, kills them. Doesn't make any difference if they're children or babies or whatever. It doesn't make no difference. Children who are killing children. And we just like, somebody got some uh, duct tape so I can wrap around my head so it keeps it from exploding. I mean, this is just unreal, isn't it? The evil that's here in this world. This is why we who believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Seventh-day Adventist Christians, tell you, we need to be getting really serious about this and our relationship with God. We really do. Because God has a purpose for every human being. You didn't come by accident. God knew every one of you before this world was ever created. He knew you by name. He knows everyone who's going to be saved. But that doesn't mean that he's just going to work on the hearts of people that, he's know he's, know, that, that he knows is going to be saved. He works on every human being's heart because he is a God of love. It's the way he is. I don't know about you, but I'm proud of my God. I'm jealous for his character. I'm jealous for his character. So many people misunderstand his character and have misconcepts of his character. I tell you, Seventh-day Adventist Christians have so many insights into the character of God. We do. And yet we seem to be silent about it. The evidence that we are followers of Jesus Christ, he said, is if you have love one for another. Everyone. It doesn't make any difference what color our skin is. Our heart is the same. Our mind is the same. If we are in Christ Jesus, we are brothers and sisters in Christ, and we are a part of the kingdom of God. You see, atheism and evolution, theistic evolution, denies the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It denies his words that when he comes, he is going to resurrect the righteous in Christ. It denies that. You see what I'm getting at? Less and less talk about the resurrection today, but more and more about the immortality of the soul. And Christians are believing in that all the time. They are believing that they can talk to their loved, their, their lost, their, their, that is the, the loved ones who have died. They believe that they can talk to them. They believe in spiritualism. 
This is denying the power of the resurrection from the dead. When I die, I will be really dead. And yet, I, who I am, my, my spirit, who I am, my whole identity is in the mind of God. Every Christian, everyone who loves Jesus Christ is in his mind. And this is why Jesus says, if you believe in me, you will never die. You will never die. You'll be asleep, but you'll never die. But death indeed is a reality. People can't really understand that. When you separate from God, and you, 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 that you, you are going to be lost for eternity. That means eternal death. That means eternal non-existence. How precious life is. Life is a miracle. And Jesus came and he gave us life everlasting. Those of us who were dead in trespasses and sin, Jesus died that we might have life everlasting. What a God. What a God. God loves us. He loves us so much. We need to look at Calvary more. We need to contemplate on that scene every day and realize what God has done for us in Jesus Christ and what the death of Jesus really means for us. I believe. I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I believe in the resurrection of the dead. I am not ashamed that I do not believe in the immortality of the soul because my Bible does, says it's not so. I believe that when I die, the next moment, the end, next instant, I will see Jesus in the clouds. And I will have a new body that he has promised me. And all of you will also. But now is the time to get busy about working for Jesus. Doesn't make any difference how old we may be. We can still do something. If nothing else, you can pray. We need to be a people of prayer. Pulling together, pressing together as we see the day approaching. Isn't that right? Jesus is coming. We need to press together as brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. This is the evidence. If you have love one for another, then shall all men know that you are my followers. And this is something that we have not seen the way we should in the Adventist church worldwide. We haven't seen that yet. I believe it's coming, don't you? I believe it's coming. Jesus is just about ready to stand up and say, it is finished, it's over. I'm coming. Enough is enough. Let us stand for our final hymn, We Would See Jesus.
our Heavenly Father. We ask that indeed you will be close to every one of us. And may your love be poured out upon each individual. And may your peace and your joy be with each one for everlasting. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. We are dismissed. Thank you.